Hey everybody, it's Brian with Engadget. We are back. We are backstage actually uh, here at Engadget Expand. I'm being joined by Mark Raybert of Boston Dynamics. Thank you so much for coming out. No, it's my pleasure. Uh, I know you guys don't do a lot of sort of public shows like this. Is there a, is there a reason? Is there a reason why you don't come out to these often? Well, you know, this show is is heavily oriented towards uh, showing your products, and you know, we mostly sell to customers who we have a relationship with, and so we sell a different way. So. Uh, you know, we come to these to recruit. Uh, people get to see what we're doing. That usually generates uh, interest for those things. We do go around and give talks, but uh, a little bit less this world, I think. Uh, you know, obviously, you guys have the, the very popular YouTube channel. So there is, there is a certain amount of, I don't know if you would consider that PR, but, you know, you're, it's, it seems to be part of your job to at least get people excited about what you're working on. Sure. And, you know, YouTube is, is a great way, right? You have complete control, so you show what you want to show. You don't show what you don't want to show. And uh, we love that. Maybe we're control freaks a little bit because uh, you get that opportunity. You get to get the feedback directly, right? You get all kinds of uh, statistics about who's watching and they leave comments. So we, I love uh, YouTube. It's been a, a huge boon for us. I think it's had a big impact on our company because, uh, uh, you know, get the word out. Mo most people know who we are and what we do uh, when we bump into them. So well, you're, you're creating uh, what, are, what are, in a lot of senses, uh, kind of a, a service robot, you know, functionality seems to be key for a lot of these, but how, how important is, is aesthetic? How important is that it's an exciting thing to look at? Ah, you know, I think it's in our culture to try and do stuff that shows through the viewfinder. You know, my ideal uh, for a project is one where when we show video, it's partly the project and partly the creating of the video. Um, the first 10 seconds, they know what it's about. You don't have to tell them any. They tell the viewer anything. They know what it's about, and, and they find it interesting somehow. You know, that's at least for presenting our stuff. That's what we're trying to do. You know, no posters with equations and with all that kind of stuff. Um, when when you come out to something like this, when when you're recruiting people, I mean, what are you what are you looking for for a new person? I mean, Boston Dynamics isn't it? It's not a huge no. company. No, but we're about 100 people now. Um, maybe half of those are the last 18 months, so they, you know, that's a fair amount of hiring. Uh, all of our people are tops, you know, technically tops. So we're, that's what we're looking for, you know, really high technical skills, ability to work with others, you know, the, the normal things. Um, so that, you know, that, that's it. Experience, building stuff. Uh, is, is creativity, is, is, you know, is being an artist important? You know, we don't explicitly look for that. Uh, uh, but. That's not a bad thing. Um, well, you, uh, the, you know, these things do an incredible <laughs> amount of different things, and I'm, I'm sort of wondering, I don't want to ask the how do you get your ideas question, but, you know, how do you decide that this is, this is something that we need to conquer with a, with a new robot? You know, our goal is to f develop the technology that's going to let the, the future generation of robots do things. You know, my opinion is that most robots today still don't do very much, certainly compared to people and animals. Uh, and it should be technically feasible to do that. So there's some fundamental progress needed. Uh, you know, we concentrate on both uh, things like dynamics and controls, but also perception is extremely important. Uh, and also the mechanical design, coming up with much more sophisticated mechanical designs. So we're always pushing on those things. and because of the kind of machines we build. They're not really products yet. They're too expensive. They take a big team to develop. We're, we're kind of looking further out, and we want to get things. And, and I think that when those things mature, then robots are going to become really a lot more capable. And not just the ones you build, but it'll, it'll spread out. You'll have components of fundamental understanding and control systems and mechanical design techniques and new kinds of actuators that everybody's going to be able to leverage. Just like now we're leveraging cheap computers, uh, better batteries, uh, more software skills and uh, availability, uh, all that stuff is already leveraging stuff. There's going to be a next generation of that that's a little bit more robotic focused, I think. So, so if if, uh, if if a big dog or at least something with, with harnessing big dogs technology, you know, come comes to market, it, you know, becomes a uh, not a consumer device, but I guess something yeah. people could buy. It's not going to be Boston Dynamics. That's going to be the the company to bring that to people. Uh, you know, that's a great question. We have a couple of smaller robots, which I didn't show today. Uh, I sort of have in my backup slides. You have the Hopper, yeah. right? We have Sandfly, which can jump thirty feet, and there's a lot of interest in that. And it's sort of more manageable. You know, the steps you have to take to get that working 
uh, perfectly and productized, I think is within reach. And we're right on the edge of deciding, we've made some small batches of deciding whether we should handle it or, uh, or get someone else to do it and work with them. Uh, you know, th there's a lot of fun in, in uh, taking something to product too. Rex is another one. Rex is a uh, ro robot about this big. Uh, it's got electric motors and batteries, so it's much easier, to, you know, the, the diversity of technology in it is, is more manageable. And uh, we've made small batches of that, and uh, I think if we get the chance, we will try and work ourselves to, uh, to manufacture bigger numbers. But for, for the most part, you're being approached by these, you know, contractors, the, these companies, and they're, they, they present you with a need. You know, they need to move something up a hill, and then you... It works both ways. It's usually the government. We do most of our work for the government, which means places like DARPA, uh, the Marine Corps, the Army, the Navy. Um, many times they come to us and say, we'd like something that would fit in this kind of a space. But many times we schmooze with them and and talk back and forth and plant seeds for projects that we think would be doable and in their interest, and then some of the, sometimes those things get funded. And there's, there's a fair amount of that, too. Um, you, you had mentioned uh, while you were giving your presentation earlier, and obviously anyone who's seen, seen the big dog and a lot of your <laughs> robots knows that these are, you know, in a sense, biologically inspired. Right. Um, when we think about science fiction, you know, robots, robots from movies, we're thinking of sort of bipedal human, humanoid robots, things that are based on biological creatures. And I'm wondering, has, has traditionally, do you feel like robotics hasn't, like actual robots in real life haven't taken that approach? Um, let me answer a slightly different question. Um, you know, even within our company, the question of whether we should be making robots that look like people is, is, uh, is an issue. It's not... I think that the functionality is the thing to focus on. What is it that we're trying to do? Things like, do we want to make something that's dexterous? Do we want to make something that's mobile? And then, and then maybe some more parameters of what the task is, like how far it has to go. You know, the guy uh, Chris was just talking talked about uh, those kinds of things. That what what are the parameters? And once you do that, you can start to come together and say. Uh, maybe you should have four legs, maybe you should have two, maybe you should look like a person. You know, we built one that was for testing human clothing, so it had to be the shape of a person. Uh, but we probably would have never done it if it hadn't been for that. And then once we had that, then other customers piled on and said, oh, let's make it do this thing rather than that thing. But I think the functionality has to, has to lead, not the form. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a large amount of interest in robots that look like humans because of something to do with yeah. the thrill and the entertainment yeah. and the sci-fi of it. You know, I don't want that to lead us. But, but certainly nature and biology have been doing something right. You know, Absolutely. it seems like a pretty good template to follow. Absolutely. Um, if you want to have a system that can handle pretty big terrain, use its hands to help with even more aggressive terrain, have its hands free to manipulate and sensors in the right place to look, obviously all those things are advantages of a human layout. But the, eng the engineering tools we have available or the materials we have available aren't exactly the same as biology, so sometimes, you know, we go somewhere else. So, so the limitation up till this point was really hardware, that it, it just wasn't easy to develop biological inspired yeah, creatures. Absolutely. You know, we, uh, complexity seems to be almost free for biological systems. Like, I don't, I don't know exactly the number, but you have many, many muscles in your arm. You have many, many joints in your fingers. And those are nearly impossible for us to build these days. And if you do, and there are people who try and things, build things with lots and lots of complexity, but usually they perform pretty poorly. So we work relentlessly to come up with simplified designs, relatively few compared to the animal's degrees of freedom, that will still let you get the, the job done. And that's really you know, part of the way to get success, is to simplify those things down as much as you possibly can. So a robot that does one thing really well, essentially. And, and I was talking really about the mechanisms themselves. Uh, you know, you don't want to necessarily have a robot arm with all the complexity uh, of our hands, uh, of our linkages, you know, our torsos. So even though we have a humanoid robot that has a torso that articulates, whereas we have, you know, I guess I should know the number, maybe 30 vertebrae that can articulate, our robots just have a few. And, and likewise with our feet and our legs. But, but, you know, you, you can certainly push that out toward, to, to, as far as the actual functioning of the robot. I mean, you know, you, you need something that can carry things up a hill, but it's not also 
probably going to talk to you or be able to open a door for you because you're going to yeah. lose some of that functionality if you focus on other things. Yeah, yeah. What you said is absolutely right. That in addition, the, the less functionality. So we talk about the complexity matrix. You know, uh, in fact, it, it applies to the, even the robots I showed today. If you take Big Dog, Big Dog could carry 120 pounds. It could go. It went 12 miles once, and it could go up rough terrain. Uh, and there's other things. But it can't do all those three things at the same time. Yet, LS3 or, or Alpha Dog, we designed to do all of its things at the same time. So that's not just n times harder, that's sort of like n squared times harder because you're having the matrix of, uh, of things all work uh, at the same time. How, how, do you, how do you advance that quickly? Is it just you know, that it, it, it takes so long to build your first one and once you've perfected that, it's easier to add things on from there? Yeah, I think that uh, there's two directions. One is you use the stuff you built for the previous one and you adapt it for the next one, but you also build up teams of skilled people who are then better at uh, developing stuff. So we have a pipeline at our company where people come in and we, we have a way of advancing them so they get uh, the skills up to, well initially up to where the other people are and then we hope uh, you know, beyond that to be able to do uh, you know, even more advanced things uh, than we're currently able to do. Are you still are you still a tinker in your regular everyday life? Uh, you know, I think it's a sad story for me. Uh, the sad story is that that's where my heart is, but almost everybody at the company is better at what they do than I would be, and so I don't get to do uh, as much hands-on yeah. stuff. Uh, you know, I, I'm good at, uh, at 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 certain things, but uh, uh, it's a lot different than the early days when you know you you could work on everything. But does, it, but does it still get to be a hobby for you outside of work? Uh, I've been building some things as a hobby, and, and it is extraordinarily gratifying. I've been doing more lately, uh, and it is, it is very gratifying. I mean, there's something about building something. I mean, that's what it's all about, you know, uh, having the idea, putting it together, and then seeing it work. That's, uh, there's, there's nothing quite like it. Thank you so much, Mark. Okay, thank you. Thank you for joining us.